Welcome to the presentation on using theory to get the most out of qualitative inquiry. This presentation is part of the workshop series to maximize the quality of qualitative health research organized by the Center for Critical Qualitative Health Research. I am Denise Gastaldo, the director of the center. I am an associate professor at the Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing and the Dalalana School of Public Health. I would like to introduce you to a few ideas that we share here at our center. And uh, they are all related to qualitative research and theory, what I'm talking to you about today. So the Center for Critical Qualitative Health Research, nicknamed CQ, has a particular perspective on qualitative research, and I think it's important for you to realize which it is. So qualitative research for us explores social issues in health and healthcare. We believe all researchers have a theoretical position, it's either implicit or explicit, and positivist qualitative research makes a very limited contribution to the field of health sciences. We also propose all researchers should understand social theory to conduct quality qualitative health research, because theorization is the basis for generalization of results. Have a warning for you watching this presentation. Some will not learn anything new from my presentation. And this basically means that you share uh, CQ's fellows' views on qualitative health research. However, some of you may find uh, that our emphasis on social theory is excessive. Most likely this means that you have a lot of health science and clinical training but haven't had the opportunity to explore social theory in depth yet. In the future, perhaps you can consider graduate courses at uh, the University of Toronto or any other university that could help you to think and to enhance your preparation as a qualitative researcher. So why talk about theory in qualitative research? First, let's start with what is theory, right? We, all assume we know that. So just to make clear that we are talking about the same thing, we are talking about an explanatory frameworks, we are talking about a system of ideas intended to explain a phenomenon where the uh, understanding of key elements can be extrapolated to other contexts. Let's think for a second of the, about the concept of um, stigma developed by Irving Goffman the so famous Canadian social scientist. So he started studying criminal deviance, but as he evolved in his development and others started to use the concept he developed, then uh, stigma has been applied to many other social groups, such as people living with disabilities, people living with chronic illness, underemployed people or unemployed people, and uh, immigrants. So, this concept has been very useful and used in very different ways uh, in the last 30 or 40 years. So an overarching explanation that explores the relationship between concepts is a theory, a lens, a way of seeing that orients you to a particular way of making sense of the world or your research is a theory, and your own assumptions about a topic are theoretically based. So it's very important that you examine your own ontoepistemological assumptions before you decide on a theory to guide your study and also to explore what is it that you really think about research, research participants, uh, what is reality. So there are many things that you can learn by examining your own thinking about research. So how do we use theory in qualitative health research? Theories help you to formulate a research question. Certain concepts can become central in the way you examine a phenomenon, for instance. Uh, theories help you to make sense of what you are seeing in your data, so very important for data analysis. Theories put disparate pieces of information together in a way that makes sense, explaining what's going on at a very higher level, so we let you abstract. And uh, theories ensure, uh, a theory can ensure rigor in your research, and also it makes possible to generalize, and uh, that means to transfer information to other contexts. So if you theorize, uh, you have a much better chance of 
uh, explaining, and like I used with the example of Goffman, explaining the situation that, creating an explanation that can be used for other groups. So is any knowledge good knowledge? Um, hierarchies of knowledge tell us that right now scientific knowledge is very prestigious. But depending on the context, common sense or lay knowledge or local knowledge can be far more important. So we have to be very careful with this super prestigious understanding we currently have about scientific knowledge. If you are lost in a subway station in a country where you don't speak the language, a person with local knowledge can do wonders for you. So depending on the circumstances, the kind of knowledge we need can be very different. And uh, it should be this, we need a more mobile hierarchy of knowledge. So um, when I speak about the superiority of scientific knowledge and all of us who produce research benefit somehow of it, I'm talking about mainly the paradigm of discovery that has dominated uh, science. And we have to think carefully because our current approach is, uh, to science has evolved over the last 200 years. So we have to understand the scientific movement as a revolutionary movement that broke away from religious ideas dominating all or most of the decision making in the social sphere. So we have to understand that while we may be critical of some elements of science nowadays, we also have achieved a lot uh, through science. So we have to examine science historically. And while we acknowledge its prestige and the power uh, it has, and therefore the rewards scientists may get, we also should be critical and understand that in the health science, for instance, the evidence-based practice movement has created a hierarchy within and it ranks uh, scientific explorations from a top to a bottom of a pyramid. And they put uh, randomized controlled trials as the best way uh, to produce knowledge and qualitative research at the bottom. Well, you are not surprised to hear I have issues with that classification, right? And in depending on the issue one to study, you, one methodology may be much better than the other. So this absolute understanding on what constitutes good science, what is good knowledge, is, is very problematic and we have to challenge it. So regarding uh, research and knowledge production, in qualitative research, the researcher is uh, the main knowledge producer and research instrument. But I'm not going to be talking about that because Dr. John Aiken's presentation touches on these aspects. I'm going to continue exploring the ideas, ideas about theory. So it's important for us before we conduct a study to ask some guiding questions. What constitutes knowledge in this study? How is knowledge being produced? What is a phenomenon worth studying? Why is knowledge uh, a possibility for humans? And what I consider a reality, there are people who are much more inclined to use idealist ideas of whatever people say and think constitutes reality. Others are much more objectivist and uh, um, use a, a realist stance. So looking for measurement, so th there is a huge variation there and you have to examine your own uh, ideas. In terms of um, the hierarchy of theoretical development, I want to call your attention that sometimes in the health science people make a lot of, um, they are confused and they use conceptual frameworks as the same as theory and they say theory is paradigm. So just to clarify and to explain how we use usually these words, uh, within a critical uh, qualitative health research. Let's m agree that a paradigm is a meta theory, is a theory about theories, is an umbrella that brings together theories that are related. A theoretical framework is what you usually call theory. 
Usually it has origins in the social sciences. It proposes a particular way of understanding society and social relations. So it tends to be big and have a name. So we're talking about big social theories such as Marxism, feminism, social symbolic interactionism. So they're, you know, very well-known theories here. But in the health science, people use a lot of conceptual frameworks or middle-range theories. So they use a concept to guide their, uh, researchers would use a concept to guide their studies. So you can see full studies on stigma or full studies on the social determinants of health or um, let's see, for people who do more clinical things on grieving or like th there are many studies based on a single concept and they are oriented by conceptual, a conceptual framework therefore. Many of the theories currently developed by qualitative research are grounded in this middle range production. So for instance, grounded theorists uh, want to say that the result of all grounded theory is a theoretical development at the middle range. Unfortunately, it's not true uh, for all the studies. We know some are much better than others, right? So, examining paradigms briefly, I assume many of you already know that. Thomas Kuhn has uh, coined the term paradigm to talk about a shared commitment and belief within a scientific community as to the nature of the legitimate problems, theories, and methods of their discipline. And uh, here I'm mentioning what I just said, paradigms should be seen by us as umbrellas that bring together many theories and also as taxonomies. So it, they allow us to think about theories that are related and share onto epistemological perspectives. We have posted for you a taxonomy uh, with, the, with three dominant paradigms in the health science for you to explore. So my key message for the moment in this presentation is before you talk about methodology, you really have to ask yourself what is it that you are exploring, in ter what is it that you think is ontology and epistemology. It is these ontoepistemological assumptions that will guide your methodological thought. So by ontology, obviously, I'm talking about what do we believe about the nature of reality and what reality is, what is the nature of reality. And epistemological assumptions are how do we know what we know and what is the nature of knowledge. So if we can address some of these issues, then we can start exploring methodologies. So how do we create knowledge depending on how we think about knowledge production? How do we go about studying the world? Those would be methodological questions. Everybody in the health science knows positivism, but uh, many people now call positivism uh, the original movement that has happened in science, and it's the historical version of what we call now post-positivism. So ontologically, reality exists but is imperfectly and probabilistically comprehended, and there is one reality and the researcher's role is to discover it. There is some degree of critical realism in current post-positivism. And epistemologically, there is a revised objectivism and dualism. Researcher and subject are independent of one another. The uh, knowledge produced in a binary, binary of oppositions where you look for falsification or verification. And finally, subjectivity is undesirable and a source of bias. So all of us in the health science have been um, exposed and many of us have used uh, these post-positivist uh, ideas to generate quantitative knowledge. What does support good qualitative research when you want to boost the level of your qualitative research, what you usually will do is work with two other paradigms. You work with critical social perspectives and you work with constructivist or interpretivist paradigms. So if you um, 
only remain uh, as a qualitative researcher working within the post-positivist post paradigm, I think you are missing on the best that qualitative research can offer to, uh, to health sciences. So which are the central ideas of the critical social paradigm? Ontologically, it's a critical uh, realism or historical realism that orients this paradigm and uh, from a Marxist and new Marxist perspective. So values are naturalized over time, and that is what we think reality is. Individuals have agency and autonomy, and uh, if you look, uh, use more of a postmodernist, post-structuralist perspective, you would think that you use a skeptical relativism where reality exists as much as it is constructed through talk, text, and media, and the subject has multiple selves. So there is not one uh, unified self. So epistemologically, it means that reality is value uh, mediated, and our findings, therefore, in research uh, are value mediated, and uh, Post, uh, sorry, post uh, structuralists and postmodernists who say truth is the dominant discourse. Examples of theories in this paradigm are feminism, uh, critical race theory, neo Marxism, post colonialism, uh, cultural studies, post structuralism, and postmodernism. Third paradigm is the interpretivist and constructivist paradigm. Uh, I will start with the theories. A lot of you know a lot of nice work done in the health science by phenomenologists or by symbolic interactionists and social constructionists. So these are theories that are organized under this paradigm. Ontologically, uh, researchers want, working within this paradigm believe that perception of reality is reality and there is a huge element of relativism where multiple mental constructions and interpretations account for a single phenomenon, and epistemology is transactional. Therefore, knowledge is socially constructed by those active in the research process. Researcher and participant are interlocked through shared meanings. There is no possibility of understanding unless you have another human being talking to the person who has experienced the phenomenon, let's imagine living with a chronic illness. So you have to have another human there to interact, and the only possibility of knowing is happens within these transactions, within these interactions. So you see, while the critical social paradigm uh, uh, researcher will be much more interested in social change and critique for the sake of transforming structures. These um, uh, researchers within the interpretivist and constructivist uh, paradigm will be much more interested in deep understanding of certain elements of lived experience. And this is what makes them different, but both bring very important contributions to the health sciences. So what are the advantages of a theory-driven research? Uh, to go beyond the face value and achieve uh, analytical depth. So that's one of the reasons why we use theory to guide qualitative health research. Also because we want to achieve theoretical congruence. Uh, we want to uh, increase the rigor. We also want an increased capacity to identify related uh, studies or areas and also uh, because it favors intraparadigmatic evaluation. I'll comment on a few of these ideas for you. Um, when people take things at face value and don't engage with either an in-depth interpretation of the phenomenon or they don't use critical uh, social elements to understand how the phenomenon is being produced socially, what happens is that especially in the health science, I would say, there is the risk that will provide a very superficial, therefore not helpful account of what's going on. So if I say, well, um, the elderly don't comply and don't take their medication, and that's all I can explain through my study, you know, there is nothing there 
to give me the power for an intervention, for developing a program later. But if I can understand how the elderly think about a particular medication, then I may have a much better understanding. For instance, why do people don't use walkers and what it represents in, in terms of their social status? Uh, why would people avoid a cane and how they, the presentation of the self in everyday life is very important and how they perform as active, as uh, you know, independent individuals and how this is essential for their selves. So these will be examples of why I need this depth to uh, really go beyond the face value of there is resistance there. For theoretical congruence, it's important to understand that if I have a clear theory, I can align the elements of the study and think everything through that theoretical lens. So it's very helpful for the researcher to have a clear theoretical orientation. That, as a consequence, increases the rigor of my study. I can show to my reviewers and readers all the steps I've taken considering the way I think about the social phenomenon and, and how this has created a very solid, uh, you know, complete, comprehensive interpretation of the phenomenon I am studying. And the increased capacity to identify related studies or areas is because you become, rather than one more descriptive study about a generic topic, you can do a search on post-structuralist studies uh, conducted with the way the elderly resist to use mobile devices, like um, devices for moving through the community or something. So it gives you also this added depth because you are looking for particular theoretical frameworks. Finally, it favors uh, intraparadigmatic evaluation because people have to read your study using that theoretical lens rather than trying to apply or impose another lens to your study. So it really gives you an advantage there. Of course, there are challenges in doing a theory-driven uh, research. The depth of knowledge, that is required from the researcher. Uh, you have really to know the field. People will expect you to cite the key authors, to understand the evolution over time and how the concepts in that theory are related. So you are expected to deliver a you know, consistent quality analysis based on that theory. And um, you are expected to use it in all phases of the study. And finally, uh, you need a very clear theory-method connection that is called uh, theoretical congruence, of course, and your reviewers, your peer reviewers, will be looking for that in your study. So there are challenges there. We have to acknowledge it. I have here an example from post-structuralism because I thought this is a little bit of an arid presentation so far. So I'm going to show you what I have thought when I used post-structuralist ideas to think my research. And um, I'm just mentioning some elements of ontology here. But it's a nice exercise for you to ask yourselves, what is it that I think is the ontology of my uh, theory? What do I think is the... Uh, um, epistemology of this theory. And finally, how then I can have a methodology that is coherently articulated to this onto-epistemological perspective. So when I work with post-structuralism, I think that reality is a set of dominant discourses. And I'm critical about what I think reality is and what people in my study present as reality. So human beings, for me, are socially constructed by their time, history, locations, and the dominant social understandings of this time. So certain ideas are, set, are only possible in certain historical moments, and that's why we think about, you know, very basic things, the body, disease, like we think the way we think precisely because we are in this uh, particular moment, and location. Autonomy and freedom are, for me, desires socially constructed by our modes of governance. 
Everybody wants to be free, nobody wants oppression. Uh, we all think our desires come from inside. We think we are autonomous beings. So I problematize that. I think we are, uh, we are governed a lot from the exterior and we come to believe that what we think is the interior in reality is uh, socially constructed, is a dominant discourse that's happening and naturalized within myself. Uh, I also think that human beings have multiple and non-coherent selves and bodies. I think it's useless to look for this coherently articulated autonomous being who will then engage in, after I provide some information, we will engage in health promotion. I, I really don't believe in that. I think we are far more complicated than that as human beings. And also, I believe that collective human activities are mediated by power relations. I believe we all exercise power, even though we are not in the same position to exercise power. And even biological life is a political event. So we care so much about life and death because life and death is political. Life and death has economic consequences. Life and death are shaping the way everybody lives in society. A sick person in a family is required a lot of care and that interferes with like large groups within a community. So there are lots of consequences just because we are alive, uh, alive and we are perhaps sick or we are in excellent health and there are certain expectations about how we work in the workplace. So I see biological uh, life as a political event. Of course, here I am citing several ideas of Michel Foucault, the main post-structuralist thinker, but I'm just saying to you how I came to think after I studied his work for many years. So what's, what's the consequence of thinking the way I'm thinking regarding my ontological assumptions? Well, personally, I do not believe in studies that propose that increasing people's knowledge without changing their living circumstances and their social position suffices to promote health. So if an um, immigrant woman is fearful of being fired, uh, that will interfere with her insulin utilization that will interfere with the way she presents herself in, in, in um, parties at the job and it's a huge slice of cake because she's afraid if people find out she has diabetes, she will be fired. So I believe the way she speaks, what she hides, will be informed by her understanding that sick people, people with chronic disease are seen in many jobs as undesirable workers. So that's, that's the consequence of thinking the way I do. Therefore, I will go into the field to talk to this woman, having these ideas in mind, and uh, that will shape uh, the way I analyze what she tells me, that will shape the way I present this study. So in summary, at the center, we think that qualitative health research is used to uh, increase our understanding of social issues in health, uh, in the field of health, and that human interactions, ideas about sickness, ideas about health, practices in healthcare are socially constructed. So there is nothing there for you to go and collect. So I problematize the notion of data collection. What are you collecting? Is there something out there to be collected? Is it like getting a basket and picking up things? I don't think so. I think we have to go interact with people and create meetings, uh, encounters that allow us to collectively or uh, you know, in pairs, in groups, to reflect about what constitutes reality. But I am a researcher who is being also constituted by those ideas. Therefore, I have to critically examine how I think myself about this phenomenon. Social theories help researchers to maximize the contribution of their studies by problematizing taken for granted assumptions that they have, that their participants have, the way we naturalize many ideas in society today. 
And, uh, for instance, I have done that in my studies to question the notion uh, that nurses are powerless. So for many, many years in my education, I have heard this idea that nurses are powerless. The system is powerful. Physicians are powerful, but nurses, oh, they struggle so much. Well, when I apply a theoretical perspective, uh, a post-structuralist perspective, to examine nurses' discourses, I realize that nurses have a lot of power and exercise power in many ways that they never perceive as power exercise because the way they thought of power was very problematic and narrowed. By expanding my, and you know, the group's understanding of, of what cons, uh, power is, we achieved in my study with a colleague a much better um, comprehension. And we published a paper that had a lot of impact in nursing because we were challenging this powerlessness uh, notion that was so dominant in nursing internationally, by the way. So a clear theoretical framework will also guide the evaluation of the research, um, um, or the, sorry, not of the research, or the papers or the reports written uh, about the research by peers from a particular conceptual or theoretical perspective. So rather than letting others impose a perspective on your study, if you are explicit about it, you have an advantage and people have to read it, read your study through that lens. So that I think helps you too. So here are some questions that I'll leave with you as food for thought. Um, before you go to your workshop, ask yourself, which theories have you used to date to guide your qualitative health research? How can you theorize your results to make your contribution more robust? And how does the topic of your workshop relate to particular theoretical perspectives? So all these questions can help you to have perhaps a better um, participation in the workshop. Finally, my last point is that I want to go back to what I said at the beginning. I know some of these ideas are completely known to some of you, but uh, we have to present these slides and these lectures for people before they go to the workshop so that they are not surprised once they are getting there and they are expecting a, a theoretical how-to uh, workshop. We want people to really think the way to do quality, qualitative research, is using uh, sophisticated social theory to help you to go beyond the descriptive, you know, and engage with a nice interpretative, uh, critical lens that will let you really produce knowledge that is innovative, that has a contribution to your field, that let people think about things they never thought before, and that can achieve can be achieved when you think theory and method together. And that's very much our approach. Thank you.